This video shows important excerpts from Arthur Schopenhauer's essay, The Wisdom of Life. This chapter is about what a man has. There is no absolute or definite amount of wealth which will satisfy a man. The amount is always relative, that is to say, just so much as will maintain the proportion between what he wants and what he gets, for to measure a man's happiness only by what he gets, and not also by what he expects to get, is as futile as to try and express a fraction which shall have a numerator but no denominator. A man never feels the loss of things which it never occurs to him to ask for, he is just as happy without them, whilst another, who may have a hundred times as much, feels miserable because he has not got the one thing he wants. Riches, one may say, are like sea water, the more you drink the thirstier you become, and the same is true of fame. The loss of wealth and prosperity leaves a man, as soon as the first pangs of grief are over, in very much the same habitual temper as before, and the reason of this is, that as soon as fate diminishes the amount of his possessions, he himself immediately reduces the amount of his claims. But when misfortune comes upon us, to reduce the amount of our claims is just what is most painful, once that we have done so, the pain becomes less and less, and is felt no more, like an old wound which has healed. Conversely, when a piece of good fortune befalls us, our claims mount higher and higher, as there is nothing to regulate them, it is in this feeling of expansion that the delight of it lies. But it lasts no longer than the process itself, and when the expansion is complete, the delight ceases, we have become accustomed to the increase in our claims, and consequently indifferent to the amount of wealth which satisfies them. When we consider how full of needs the human race is, how its whole existence is based upon them, it is not a matter for surprise that wealth is held in more sincere esteem, nay, in greater honor, than anything else in the world, nor ought we to wonder that gain is made the only good of life, and everything that does not lead to it pushed aside or thrown overboard, philosophy, for instance, by those who profess it. People are often reproached for wishing for money above all things, and for loving it more than anything else, but it is natural and even inevitable for people to love that which, like an unwearied produce, is always ready to turn itself into whatever object their wandering wishes or manifold desires may for the moment fix upon. Money alone is absolutely good, because it is not only a concrete satisfaction of one need in particular, it is an abstract satisfaction of all. If a man has an independent fortune, he should regard it as a bulwark against the many evils and misfortunes which he may encounter, he should not look upon it as giving him leave to get. What pleasure he can out of the world, or as rendering it incumbent upon him to spend it in this way. People who inherit money know, at least, how to distinguish between capital and interest, and most of them try to make their capital secure and not encroach upon it. So most of them maintain their position. It will generally be found that those who know what it is to have been in need and destitution are very much less afraid of it, and consequently more inclined to extravagance, than those who know poverty only by hearsay. People who have been born and bred in good circumstances are as a rule much more careful about the future, more economical, in fact, than those who, by a piece of good luck, have suddenly passed from poverty to wealth. This looks as if poverty were not really such a very wretched thing as it appears from a distance. The true reason, however, is rather the fact that the man who has been born into a position of wealth comes to look upon it as something without which he could no more live than he could live without air he guards it as he does his very life, and so he is generally a lover. Of order, prudent and economical. But the man who has been born into a poor position looks upon it as the natural one, and if by any chance he comes in for a fortune, he regards it as a superfluity, something to be enjoyed or wasted, because, if it comes to an end, he can get on just as well as before, with one anxiety the less. Women who were poor before their marriage often make greater claims, and are more extravagant, than those who have brought their husbands a rich dowry, because, as a rule, rich girls bring with them, not only a fortune, but also more eagerness, nay, more of the inherited instinct, to preserve it, than poor girls do. A woman of fortune, being used to the handling of money, spends it judiciously, but a woman who gets the command of money for the first time upon her marriage, has such a gusto in spending it, that she throws it away with great profusion. I recommend people to be careful to preserve what they have earned or inherited. For to start life with just as much as will make one independent, that is, 
allow one to live comfortably. Without having to work, even if one has only just enough for oneself, not to speak of a family, is an advantage which cannot be overestimated, for it means exemption and immunity. From that chronic disease of penury, which fastens on the life of man like a plague, it is emancipation from that forced labor which is the natural lot of every mortal. Only under a favorable fate like this can a man be said to be born free, to be, in the proper sense of the word, sui juris, master of his own time and powers, and able to say every morning, this day is my own. Inherited wealth reaches its utmost value when it falls to the individual endowed with mental powers of a high order, who is resolved to pursue a line of life not compatible with the making of money, for he is then doubly endowed by fate and can live for his genius, and he will pay his debt to mankind a hundred times, by achieving what no other could achieve, by producing some work which contributes to the general good, and redounds to the honor of humanity at large. But a man, who never attempts to learn the rudiments of any branch of knowledge so that he may at least do what he can towards promoting it, such a one, born as he is into riches, is a mere idler and thief of time, a contemptible fellow. He will not even be happy, because, in his case, exemption from need delivers him up to the other extreme of human suffering, boredom, which is such martyrdom to him, that he would have been better off if poverty had given him something to do. And as he is bored he is apt to be extravagant, and so lose the advantage of which he showed himself unworthy. What every one most aims at in ordinary contact with his fellows is to prove them inferior to himself, and how much more is this the case in politics. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the Love of Learning channel to see more videos like this one. The two videos shown on the screen might interest you. Click on them to learn more.